Ah, uh, what's next? Sergio Leone's 1966 masterpiece, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, is in every cinephile's top 10 and is certainly one of my favorites. I have seen this film so many times I almost do not need to watch it and for the purposes of this review, I am going to assume you have seen it as well. For those of you who have not seen this 50 plus year old film, first of all, shame on you, and secondly, there will be spoilers. We are going to have a thorough discussion and post-mortem of this movie. Let's get started. The movie opens with the MGM line and then a white screen with a splash of blood red, an animation of a horse rider, and of course that iconic, memorable theme song by Ennio Morricone. Note that there are three elements to this theme, the whistle or flute, that wah-wah-wah vocalization, and the guitar or the bass notes. These three elements form a cohesive and beautiful melody, and you need all three for it to work. It refers to the three heroes, or let's be honest, anti-heroes of this movie. Also note the timing of the theme, the beat count, which is very reminiscent of a horse gallop. The opening credits are a montage of sepia tone stills that immediately sets the mood and time period. And these photos are splashed with brush strokes of bold, almost violent color, reds and greens, as if the director is painting, which he essentially is. This movie is a work of art. Every frame is a renaissance painting, perfectly composed and balanced, with deliberate thought and artistic effort. And as an aside, the next time you see this movie, try to watch it on the biggest screen available. Most movies these days are designed to be watched on your phone. This movie, however, was designed to be seen on a screen the size of a billboard. And it really comes to life when the scenes are, so to speak, larger than life. The title of the film is emphasized with cannon fire, three shots for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Artillery, because one, it's louder than a gunshot, and two, this movie is set at the end of the Civil War. And the movie opens with a bounty hunter, a random craggy face that fills the screen and pulls out to reveal a dusty western town. It could be Valentine or Tumbleweed. It is in fact Almeria, a region of Spain. This movie was filmed in Italy and Spain with an Italian director and production crew, hence the phrase Spaghetti Western. If Almeria sounds familiar, it's because Juan Cristobal Valdespino, the renowned treasure hunter who once had high tea with the Viceroy of India, mentions Almeria when speaking to Arthur, a direct reference to this specific movie. Three bounty hunters slowly converge on a saloon, and when I mean slowly, I mean painfully slow. This movie takes its time. The pacing will seem leisurely to a modern audience, but imagine if you were trying to take down a notorious outlaw, if you were potentially walking towards your own death, you would be cautious as well. This slow pace builds incredible tension if the viewer is patient enough to sit back and enjoy it. They rush in the station, but the camera doesn't follow them. Instead, you hear gunfire and a man leaps out of the window, holding a cattleman in one hand and a turkey leg in the other. He has a sly grin and a mouthful of food. The frame freezes. You hear the five notes of the theme song and the title, The Ugly. This is Tuco Benedicto Pacifico Juan Maria Ramirez, as portrayed by Eli Wallach. A Mexican bandit wanted for a laundry list of crimes with a $2,000 bounty on his head. I know he's really holding a cult single action army or perhaps a cult navy, however this is a Red Dead Redemption 2 channel and Arthur and that world is never far from my thoughts. And a note on the title, the good, the bad and the ugly, or in the original Italian, il buono, il bruto, il cattivo, or the good, the ugly and the bad. Bruto is spelled with two T's for ugly, however, Bruto with one T is brute or brutal, which is a far better description of Tuco than simply ugly. Granted, he is the least attractive of the three, and perhaps one could argue that his character is ugly, but as the movie progresses, you will discover that Tuco is the most dimensional and relatable character in the movie. Of course, we all strive to be as cool as Clint Eastwood, or as hard as Lee Van Cleef. But in the end, all we are really doing is searching for that metaphorical giant turkey leg and fortune in stolen Civil War gold. But don't worry about the gold just yet. Tuco has to escape. He steals a horse and rides out of town. In the next scene, we're at a ranch and back to that slow pace. Lee Van Cleef rides up, wearing what looks like a Nevada hat and sporting an offhand holster. 
This is angel eyes, or more like devil eyes. Wikipedia describes him as a mercenary, but he's actually a sergeant of the Union Army who moonlights as a hitman or hired gun. This ranch belongs to a Civil War deserter named Stevens who has escaped the war and settled down with a wife and two sons. However, the war has followed Stevens and Angel Eyes is on the hunt for the aforementioned Civil War gold and is tracking one of his friends, Jackson, who now goes by the name Bill Carson. Remember that name, it will become significant. There is a tense scene at the dinner table as all of this plays out. Again, the pacing is slow and deliberate. Stevens attempts to hire Angel Eyes to kill Baker, the man who sent him. But Angel Eyes ends up shooting Stevens at the table and also his son as he rushes downstairs with a shotgun. The wife and mother stares at the scene in horror, faints, and the scene fades to black. Only to open up again on Angel Eyes, now in Baker's room. He catches him asleep but collects the bounty on Stevens, then puts a pillow over his face and shoots him four times in the head, which seems excessive but okay. Angel lifts up a lantern, smiles sardonically as he prepares to blow it out, but the camera freezes and you have eight more notes of the theme and the words, the bad. Back to Tuco on the run, but he doesn't get very far before he's bushwhacked by even more bounty hunters. He is a very popular outlaw, which is fine by Tuco, because he thinks pretty well of himself, and all of this attention just enhances it. They are about to take him when they are interrupted by yet another bounty hunter. And finally, almost 20 minutes into the film, you get your first appearance of Clint Eastwood, the star of this movie in the role that would make him a legend. The camera focuses on his cattleman as he fires. You get three notes of the theme, but this time no freeze frame with the title, The Good. I suppose everyone knows Clint is The Good, but to be fair, he's only marginally better than the other two. What he is, is a good old-fashioned movie star, impossibly handsome, with a charismatic style that lights up the screen and dominates and overwhelms every scene he's in. There's a reason these people are called stars. They shine, at least on screen, and in this movie he is known simply as Blondie, though in the Italian version he is referred to as Joe. He is, however, the man with no name, and interestingly enough, he is not wearing his signature poncho. He is wearing a duster and is dressed like a bounty hunter, a very easy look to replicate in Red Dead Redemption 2. Blondie hogties Tuco, throws him on the back of a horse and takes him to the nearest town. Again, very reminiscent of Valentine or Tumbleweed. Tuco is swearing and shouting and insulting Blondie's mother in Spanish, but he barely attracts a crowd as they ride up to the sheriff's and Blondie collects the bounty. The town is eager for a public hanging as there is no TV or internet in 1862 and Tuco is quickly strung up on the back of a horse. But at the last minute, Blondie shoots the rope with his trusty carbine repeater. The horse runs off and Clint shoots the hats off the sheriffs and deputies to discourage them from chasing. Outside of town, they split the bounty, evenly of course, which Tuco resents, as it's his neck in the noose. Tuco thinks he deserves more. There are two kinds of men, he tells Blondie, those with the rope around their necks and those who do the cutting. However, Blondie is quick to point out that his aim might decrease if the percentage changes and they leave it at that for the moment and move on to the next town. They are essentially farming dollars, but they attract the attention of Angel Eyes, who is still looking for Bill Carson and that stolen Confederate gold. Angel Eyes watches another hanging and it's great to see Tuco with another noose around his neck looking bored and vaguely inconvenienced. Everything goes according to plan, however Blondie is bored with the scheme and Tuco's constant complaints and double crosses him. He keeps the money and Tuco keeps the rope, as he says, and he leaves him in the middle of the desert, no gun, no hat, no water, hands tied and a noose around his neck. And finally, as Clint rides off and Tuco blusters and threatens, 30 minutes into the movie Blondie turns back, the camera freezes and we get the theme again and the words the good. Though, as mentioned before, he is only marginally better than the other two. However, Tuco is first and foremost a survivor, and of course, this is not the last we'll see of him. Tuco gets the last word in and calls Blondie a hijo de grande puta, or son of a great whore, and we move on to Angel Eyes, who interrogates a lady friend of Bill Carson's. He slaps her around, and I apologize if that makes you uncomfortable, but this is a 50-year-old movie full of hard men and hard women. Everyone takes a beating in this movie. And let's not forget, 
but these people are acting. It's all pretend. You're not supposed to beat women in real life any more than shooting someone in the street. You should know that already. It should be unsaid. This is a movie. This is not reality. Always remember that. At any rate, Angel Eyes learns Bill Carson's army regiment and a general trail and is off on the hunt. Meanwhile, Tuco has made his way to the nearest town. He rehydrates in a horse trough and finds the nearest gunsmiths for one of my favorite scenes in the movie. He demands to see the entire inventory and you can see Tuco's expertise as he tests the actions and rolls the cylinders, assessing the trueness of barrels and the quality of the steel. Finally, he starts disassembling the revolvers and making his own custom gun. He also has a couple swigs of whiskey, robs the store owner of all of his cash, and interestingly, a strip of leather that he fashions into a lanyard for his cattleman, which he attaches to the handle. Tuco likes to keep his gun around his neck, stowed in his front pocket or his waistband. Kyle Reese uses a variation of this technique with his sawed-off shotgun in The Terminator, which seems inspired by this very scene. And there is a very similar scene with Kevin Kline as Payton in Silverado, another grand epic western that I can highly recommend. We get a montage of Tuco tracking Blondie, looking over old campfires and noticing his signature cheroot or cigarette-sized cigars, and sometimes even smoking them. There is a lot of cigarette sharing in this movie, an oddly intimate act, indicating how close these characters are, and how they are the opposite sides of the same coin. Tuco collects some sidekicks and catches up with Blondie at a hotel. The sidekicks come in the front and Blondie easily takes them out, but Tuco comes in from the back, in the window, and gets the drop on him. Tuco sets up another noose and is ready to hang Blondie when the hotel explodes from an artillery shell. The war has caught up with him and it's cannon ex machina. Cannons are a theme in this film, recall the opening credits. Blondie escapes and we move on to Angel Eyes at a wrecked Civil War fort, very reminiscent of that bombed out church in Bulger Glade, which has become a Confederate hospital full of the dying and wounded. Angel Eyes is still looking for Bill Carson and we learn that he has a patch over one eye and that he might be in a Yankee prison camp called Batterville. Tuco catches up with Blondie in the desert. I feel I should mention that I cannot say the name Tuco without thinking of Tuco Salamanca from Breaking Bad. Vince Gilligan has said repeatedly that he was making a modern western, so I am fairly certain that his Tuco is a reference to this Tuco. At any rate, Tuco leads Blondie on a sadistic death march through the desert. No hat, no water, and no rest. It is a very Catholic directing style. A hero must suffer like Christ on the cross, and the film revels in Clint's suffering. Finally, at his weakest moment, Tuco is about to execute him when they spot a stagecoach in the distance. Tuco investigates, and it's full of dead Confederate soldiers and one nearly dead who happens to be named, you guessed it, Bill Carson. Let's call it Stagecoach Ex Machina. Bill Carson offers Tuco $200,000 in gold for a sip of water, and he tells him the gold is hidden at Sad Hill Cemetery. Tuco goes off for the water, but Bill Carson is dead when he returns, but not before telling Blondie the name of the grave where the treasure is buried. And just like that, Blondie becomes Tuco's best friend. I find it amusing how allegiances in this movie shift with new information. Tuco knows the cemetery, Blondie knows the grave, and now they are partners again. Blondie recovers at a monastery or a church where we learn one of the friars is Tuco's brother. He tells Tuco that their father just died, and their mother died nine years ago. You can see the emotions play across Eli Wallach's face before he decides on anger and defiance. This scene is interesting because it humanizes Tuco in a way we don't get with Angel Eyes or Blondie. Tuco had parents. He was once a little boy. He was once innocent. Blondie and Angel Eyes emerge fully formed, heroic or anti-heroic, and we know nothing of them other than their skill with the gun. We don't even know Blondie's real name. Tuco assumes the uniform and identity of Bill Carson right down to the eye patch, and along with Blondie in another Confederate uniform, they start the trek towards the graveyard and ride straight into the Union Army. They are, of course, captured and sent to the nearest POW camp, which just happens to be Batterville, and even more coincidentally, Angel Eyes is posing, or perhaps actually is, a Union sergeant stationed there. 
Lots of coincidences in this film, but trust me, it works. Of course, Angel Eyes recognizes Tuco and Blondie, and after another long beating that the camera is more than happy to dwell on, Tuco gives up the name of the cemetery. Angel Eyes, however, does not torture Blondie, knowing that he would never break, and instead informs him that he has a new partner. Tuco is left at the camp to die, and Angel Eyes and Blondie ride off. However, Angel Eyes also has six riders with him. Note that Blondie has six bullets. Even if he got all six of them, he would still have to reload, and Angel Eyes would have the drop on him. It's an interesting insurance policy. However, never write off Tuco Benedicto Pacifico Juan Maria Ramirez. He is transported, handcuffed to the man who tortured him by train, and it's easy enough to jump off the train, drag the guard with him, and smash his head on a rock. Tuco knows exactly where Angel Eyes and Blondie are heading and sets off behind them. They catch up in a bombed out town. Tuco gets ambushed in the bathtub by some rando who recognizes him, and Blondie finds him after investigating the gunfire. Deciding that a two-way split is far better than a seven-way, Blondie reunites with Tuco and together they take out Angel Eyes six gunmen. But Angel Eyes escapes, so now they're chasing him. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is essentially an extended chase scene through Sergio Leone's version of the American Southwest, set against the background of the Civil War, which seems anachronous to American viewers, a geographic inconsistency, but makes perfect sense to an Italian director who learned American history from the movies. And, in Sergio Leone's defense, the Civil War did extend as far west as Arizona. The Battle of Picacho Pass, to quote Wikipedia, also known as the Battle of Picacho Peak, was an engagement of the American Civil War on April 15, 1862. The action occurred around Picacho Peak, 50 miles northwest of Tucson, Arizona. It was fought between a Union cavalry patrol from California and a party of Confederate pickets from Tucson, and marks the westernmost battle of the American Civil War. And here is a beautiful photo of Picacho Peak, looking straight out of Undead Nightmare or New Austin. However, the scope and the grandeur of the battles portrayed in this film would historically have happened in the south, east of all of these locations, near all of that civilization. Also, I should mention that the scale of these battle scenes will stagger the modern viewer's imagination when you realize that these are actual actors, real people. The only modern movie that comes close in this scale would be the Battle of Helm's Deep in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, but Sauron didn't actually have an army of 10,000. At the most, he had 50 orcs in uruk and the rest were cut and pasted to fill out the screen. However, this is long before CGI, and if you wanted to film a battle scene, you had to do it the old-fashioned way with a giant crowd of people, all in uniforms with weapons, horses, cannons, spiked bollards like you see in Bolger Glade, and also with actual explosions and actual reactions to those explosions. All of this analog realism adds an authentic verisimilitude that is missing in modern cinemas and, sadly these days, almost impossible to recreate. Moving on, our boys stumble directly into the Northern Army and one of those large-scale battles. The cemetery is across the river between the Union and Confederate Army. They are fighting over a bridge, so Tuco and Blondie decide to blow up the bridge so the armies will move on and fight somewhere else, which seems reasonable and is exactly what happens. As they are setting the charges, the boys have a fleeting moment of honesty and decide to trust one another with their information. The cemetery is Sad Hill Cemetery, and the grave is Arch Stanton. The bridge blows up, and now it's a mad dash to the cemetery. Clint stops to care for a dying soldier. He shares his cigarette and gives him his duster, and picks up a poncho. The poncho, it turns out, that the now dead soldier was using as a pillow. The poncho has dead people germs on it, but that didn't matter so much in the Old West. Tuco steals Blondie's horse and rides off. However, there is a nearby cannon conveniently still loaded, and in one of the most iconic scenes in cinematic history, Clint Eastwood lights the cannon with his cheroot and blows Tuco clean off his horse. The horse is fine. Don't worry about the horse. Tuco gets blasted right into the graveyard, which is massive, almost endless. It seems to extend to the horizon. And note that this is real. Every one of those crosses had to be manufactured. Those mounds of earth were actually dug. There is no cut and paste here. This is the reality and glory of analog filmmaking. 
As Tuco begins his search, he is startled by a stray dog, and every time I see that dog, I wonder if he was scripted or merely a random stray dog who wandered on the set looking for a handout. And what follows may very well be my favorite movie scene of all time. Tuco running through the cemetery to Ennio Morricone's La Stasi del Oro, The Ecstasy of Gold. A magnificent, operatic, and simply sublime piece of music that perfectly complements the frenzy, desperation, relief, and anticipation of that moment. Tuco runs around searching for Arch Stanton, and by the end the camera is spinning around faster than the eye can follow until it finally focuses on the grave, Tuco's face full of greed and gold fever. This scene is on YouTube, and I highly recommend you go watch it after this. Tuco hugs the wooden tombstone of Arch Stanton in a morbidly charming moment before tearing off a plank and starting to dig. Tuco gets down to the wood of the coffin and starts scratching at the earth he's so close, and that's when you see Blondie's shadow and the theme plays. Clint is now in his iconic poncho. He throws Tuco a shovel. Tuco pauses for a moment, wondering if they should throw down, then shrugs and decides to dig. And then another shovel is tossed on the grave, and Angel Eyes appears with the great line, two can dig a lot quicker than one. However, Clint Eastwood is too cool to dig, it's in his contract. He lights a cigarette and makes a proposition. You see, there's nothing in Arch Stanton's grave but bones. Blondie will write the real name on the back of a rock and they can shoot for it. At the center of the graveyard is a circle of rocks, looking very much like a gladiatorial ring. The graves radiate outward from this ring, much like the rays of a sun or a compass. The three gunmen take their position with their audience of the dead, symbolic of all the men they have killed, and what follows is a long, leisurely setup focused on faces, eyes, hands, guns, gun belts, as each of them strategize and think about who they want to kill first. It is a glorious scene, and again, perfectly complemented by Ennio Morricone's perfect soundtrack. Finally, Angel Eyes shoots, but Blondie is faster, of course. He shoots Angel Eyes right into a convenient open grave, and then shoots his hat and revolver into the grave after him for good measure. Tuco's gun is empty, which I am surprised he never noticed, Blondie having emptied it at an earlier point. He is dry firing, desperately. There is no name on the rock, because the treasure is buried in the unknown grave next to Arch Stanton, which means more digging for Tuco. Tuco finds the gold. He hacks at a sack with his shovel and the gold spills out. There is a moment on his face of pure bliss before he looks up and sees the hangman's knot perfectly framed in the center of the film. Tuco stands on the cross with his hands tied and his neck on the noose. Blondie takes his half of the gold and rides off, with Tuco balanced precariously, shouting after him. However, at the edge of the graveyard, Blondie turns and shoots the rope as the theme song starts for the final time. Tuco screams, he falls on his gold, the camera freezes on his snarling, desperate face, and the title reads, The Ugly. And then on Angel Eyes in his grave, The Bad. And finally on Blondie with his repeater, and The Good. Blondie rides off, leaving Tuco with his half of the gold, still tied up and with a noose around his neck, just like old times. Tuco gets the last word or curse in, but he's cut off by the theme song as the credits roll. And that, my friends, is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, a perfect film that has never been eclipsed. The performances laid the foundation for so many movies. Blondie is basically Han Solo in the Old West, and this movie is the gold standard against which every subsequent western has now been measured. However, after multiple viewings, I have found that my favorite character is Tuco. They are all equally bad. The movie is basically the bad, the badder, and the worst. And yet Tuco is the only one who seems to be enjoying himself. Even at his most miserable, he's still having fun. I like that. Tuco has a good attitude. The movie was dubbed, of course, being an international production, and the actors performed their lines in their native language, and then everything was added in post. Interestingly, this movie was filmed silently, so in addition to all the dialogue, all of the ambient sounds were also added later. This adds a level of surrealism to the film. Everything is slightly off or enhanced. Footsteps and gunfire can be louder than it seems, and of course, that beautiful Morricone soundtrack takes center stage. 
Additionally, I know how you kids like to say OK Boomer, but understand that most of the actors in this film lived through or served in World War II, with the exception of Clint Eastwood who served in Korea. These are the Boomer's parents. They have seen death and hardship firsthand. They have personal experiences and living through the war and enduring World War II, having that in your memory and life experience adds a level of realism and authenticity to their performances that you simply cannot replicate. It's more than acting, it's life. And it's not just the actors, it's the crew, it's the director, the cinematographer. It is a collective effort that has been captured in every frame of this movie. It's almost magical, certainly alchemical, and it makes for a perfect cinematic experience. This video is sponsored by viewers like you. Consider joining the channel and becoming a member for deputy badges by your name, custom emoticons in the premiere chats, end credits in every video, and daily members-only community posts featuring my random musings on life, TV and movie reviews, and exclusive photos. I'm Super Antonio. Thanks for watching. I appreciate your views. Like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell for daily Red Dead Redemption 2 content. We shall meet again. Further on down the trail. Yep. We do more than just hunting. We're hunted. And them things hunting us, well, they got guns of their own. I ain't afraid of dying. 